everybody good? Cool. So um, as always, remember quiz five is due Sunday. Um, if you haven't done quiz four yet, which is about half of you, make sure you do it. I know you got an extra day thanks to web courses being down on Thursday, but take advantage of getting it done as quickly as possible. Uh, connecting with biology number one is due next Monday at 11.59 p.m. If you submit it ahead of time, I think I'm going to cut it off to like this Wednesday will be the last day I can have enough time feasibly to review it and let it get back to you and then you can resubmit. So Wednesday will be the last time that if you wanted to take advantage of submitting it early, you can. And exam two is coming up. So remember that, that thing I just mentioned. All right. So in regards to exam one, I did wanted to show this real quick. Average was right at an 80.5. And that includes a, a couple zeros that people just didn't take the test or had excuse, unexcused absences, that kind of thing. Um, if for some odd reason, you think that there's a issue with the scantrons that got graded, if you were like in here and took a test, because uh, at this point, I'm not going to take any more absences unless you have a very ex strong extenuating circumstance why you couldn't have talked to me for the last two weeks. Um, go ahead and let me know. Like, if there's any weird issues, like where you took this test and it's showing up as a zero, let me know. I'll, I have hundreds of scantrons. Sometimes one kind of falls through the cracks. Um, but yeah, the high was 100. There were quite a few of y'all that got 100. The low was 38. So. I know a lot of y'all finished early. Definitely would maybe take a little bit of extra time to double check your questions, just to be safe. All right, let's go ahead and get started with our system for today. Today we're talking, or we're continuing on with our kind of discovery of um, the different parts of the body and all that kind of fun stuff. And we're gonna dig into the nervous system and how senses work. Now the nervous system forms a rapid communication network. Remember how we talked about how the endocrine system is kind of that slow chemical response, whereas the nervous system is that fast electrical response. Now, this rapid communication between cells is fundamental to the function of an animal nervous system. You have to have it to be able to make quick snap decisions on how far a muscle should move and all that kind of fun stuff. Again, these are primarily powered by electrical chemical impulses in the nervous system, which travel so fast that effects seem almost instantaneous. Now it's not exactly instantaneous and some of y'all may have noticed this if you've ever had to deal with like trying to download something off the internet or something like that, where if it gets posted, say from here in Orlando, it may take it about a second or two for it to show up in Shanghai, China. Like there's just a slight offset, but it's not enough for it to really matter, especially when you're going across massive, unless you're going across massive distances. Now the nervous system is crucial for kind of being the center for those negative feedback loops like we talked about at the end of previous lecture. These negative feedback loops are there to maintain homeostasis and it requires communication between the sensors, the control center and the effectors. In other words, you have to have that communication between the thermostat, the air conditioning unit and uh, the person that's going to turn the air conditioning unit on if you will. Um, now the nervous system is primarily responsible for detecting, interpreting, and responding to stimuli from outside and within the body. Now, ultimately, the nervous system is going to consist primarily of nervous tissue, which is primarily made up of a very specialized cell type called neurons. Now, neurons are interconnected cells that communicate via electrical impulses. You have the neuroglia, which are a form of neurons that provide physical support for neurons. Um, so they're not quite the exact same thing, but they're and then you have many neurons work, working together that's going to allow you to basically create these long daisy chained neurons, you know, back to back to back that allows you to move that electrical chemical from the top of your head down to your toes. Now, vertebrates are very specialized in this regard. Humans are incredibly specialized, in particular, um, where we have very complex nervous systems. So for example, animals like the lynx and this rabbit shown here are gonna to have to rely on their ability to detect stimuli. So they need to be able to detect if a predator's nearby or if prey's nearby. They then need to be able to coordinate responses. So how quickly are you gonna run? What direction should you run? Those sorts of questions. Or memories. Well, when I ran this direction last time to catch that rabbit, I missed. Maybe I should run the other direction. Solve problems and communicate. Obviously, we kind of have a very human-centric view of the world sometimes, but it's pretty easy to kind of totally gloss over things like chimpanzees, gorillas, elephants, 
uh, dolphins, a lot of them have very similar abilities to communicate, not quite to the level of humans. It's kind of like a, if we're like 100%, they're at like 85, um, just because they don't have quite as developed of um, communication systems and all that kind of fun stuff that allows us to completely change ecosystems entirely, which is kind of incredible if you think about it. I mean, just look at the room you're sitting in. We're not sitting out in a grassy field, right? That re relied on communication, memories, coordination, learning how to use tools, all that kind of fun stuff. And all of that is powered by your nervous system. Now things, you have a couple of different kinds of responses when it comes to your nervous system. You have the peripheral nervous system, which carries information to and from the brain. For instance, back to this rabbit and lynx example, it's there to detect the rat or the, the rabbit, um, the neurons in the lynx, his ears, eyes, and notes are activated by that sensory input. Oop. Then you have the central nervous system. That's kind of the overarching control of everything. So in this case, it's things like the brain and the lynx that's going to integrate with the spinal cord and input from that peripheral nervous system and decide how to respond. And finally, all that information then goes back out to, through the central and peripheral nervous systems to actually coordinate the response. So the neurons are gonna tell skeletal muscles and tell things like the heart and lungs to increase activity. So that way that lynx can actually chase down that rabbit. And what's kind of cool is, I'm sure many of y'all have been to Disney or Universal or what have you, you can trick these sensory inputs and do really fun stuff with it. And makes you, like you can mess with things and just change the chemical compositions and stuff just slightly enough that you can trick your brain into thinking something else is going on. If you've ever done like an, uh, crazy houses or something like that, there's a great example of this at Knott's Berry Farm out in California, but where they basically can build things on the side of a hill. So while you're in that room, it looks like everything is straight up and down. But if you were to drop a, like say a, a uh, drop a glass of water or something like that and pour it, it pours uphill because the actual angle of the house is sitting like this. And it, it's such a weird phenomenon. It's the same reason why we have things like motion sickness because your brain thinks you're not moving, but your body is telling you that it is. Now, neurons are the functional unit of the nervous system. So these neurons communicate with the muscles, the glands, and other neurons, and all neurons have the same basic parts. And the cell body is that primary kind of Normal thing that all cells have. You have the dendrites, they're all these little branches. This dendron is tree. So, dendrology, um, I know some of you are probably scrapbook or some of the class. Right there. Um, that's where that's coming from. And the better these acts on this long tail that usually features the pylon as a compound, which helps to like protect the electrical impulses out of the cell. The cell body is going to contain the nucleus, the mitochondria, and all the other organelles. And the dendrites are going to extend outwards and touch other cells to communicate. That's where it's going to be the receiving end of that particular neuron. The axon is going to conduct nerve pulses away from the cell. So in other words, it's going to receive it from the dendrites and release the um, message through to the axon. This is often coded in myelon to maximize the conductance. It's basically just going to reduce the amount of uh, interference that that axon is going to exhibit. And ultimately, we have something called the synapse, which is where the neurons deliver its signal to a muscle gland or other neuron. In other words, the signal is coming slightly. Now, there are three classes of neurons that make up the nervous system. Uh, these neurons work together to coordinate and reactions to stimuli together. You have sensory neurons, which are part of the peripheral nervous system. These are going to be things that bring information from the body organs, such as heat, pain, taste, and what have you, towards a central nervous system. In other words, these are the actual receptors. They're what's picking up those external cues that the body needs to react to. Then you have the interneurons which are part of the central nervous system. These inner neurons are gonna receive signals from those sensory neurons that we just mentioned, and they're gonna process that message and then send it out to the motor neurons. And finally, we get to the motor neurons, which are part of the peripheral nervous system. These motor neurons are there to conduct the messages from the central nervous system 
into the muscles and glands to actually stimulate activity. So in other words, just to run this down, you're gonna start in the peripheral nervous system with those sensory uh, neurons. You're gonna pick up a signal that says, I'm cool. Go into neurons, up to your brain, now, action potential is how all these messages are moving around. So each neuron in a network sends a message to the next cell via action potentials. Now, these action potentials are just, you know, quick little electrical pulses that are generally released through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, and now this neural impulse is a series of these action potentials that spread along the axon. So in other words, all those electrical signals are piling up together and moving together as one. And ultimately these action potentials are there, they'll pass along the neuron axons very rapidly. So the electrical charges near the neuron's membrane become momentarily reversed at that spot. And then after that spot, along the axon to create the action potential. Basically it starts as kind of, say for instance, you've got positively charged um, cell body as well as a positively charged axon. It's gonna get that quick hit from a, an electrical impulse from another cell. It's gonna turn it to slightly negative. Then that negative is gonna pass down through the axon and back out the cell to where everything kind of goes back to normal. The neurons are there to maintain resting membrane potential. So at rest, a neuron's inside is negatively charged relative to the outside of the cell. And the reason for that is so it, can, it doesn't require as much energy to get to that action potential. Now neurons use ions to maintain a resting membrane potential. So in other words, they're gonna positively charge certain areas so that way they can remain negatively charged. Now neurons work through this by keeping a, uh, so the potassium concentration higher inside the cell than outside, and the sodium concentration higher outside of the cell than inside. And ultimately, as a result of that, it creates that negative, slightly negative charge inside the cell, at least while it's resting. Now, ions inside and outside of the cell are going to help keep that membrane potential as negative as possible. So essentially, you could use almost a voltage meter that measures these charges across the neuron's membrane. And at resting potential, that charge inside that neuron is negative. If you haven't figured it out, it's really important to remember that it's negative. Now these action potentials result from changes in the electrical charge. So a neuron's resting potential keeps it primed to convey a message at any moment. That's why it's that slightly negative. And so when a neuron is stimulated, those ions flow across the membrane to create action potential. It's gonna slightly positively charge that membrane all of a sudden. And then it's going to, and because that neuron wants to get rid of that slight positive charge, it's gonna to try to push it out as quickly as possible. This is gonna result in the stimulation of neurons that opens up these sodium channels. And the more stimulation, the more channels open and for a longer period of time. So sodium ions enter the cell, collect near the membrane and reverse that charge. And so that way it'll be pushed back towards that negative. Now those sodium ions are then gonna to accumulate to start that action potential. Basically all those sodium ions rushing in are gonna make that positive charge there. And that's what then is going to release the action potential through the rest of the cell. Now, once that action potential begins, more sodium channels are going to open, allowing for even more sodium ions to enter the cell. And ultimately the, the membrane is now gonna have a positive charge on the inside. What's going to happen is the K ions, they're potassium ions, are gonna then reestablish the resting potential within milliseconds. So this happens really, really fast and essentially that's why it's a, almost an electrical response. Those, calcium, or those potassium ions are gonna diffuse out of the cell as the sodium ion channels close, returning that membrane back to its resting potential. And inside the axon, the, um, it, the axon is then gonna become negative relative to the outside. Now, as I kind of mentioned, these myelin sheaths are going to speed up that communication. So a neural impulse moves up to about 10, 100 times faster over myelinated axons compared to unmyelinated axons. Now these sodium ions jump from one gap in the myelin to the next, skipping over much of the length of the axon. So in other words, it's basically going 
here, 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 instead of having to run a whole length of that down. Ultimately, these neurons are going to pass that message along. The neuron forms, this is going to be what helps to allow those neurons to form that communication network by passing that information from one cell to another. And ultimately, this is accomplished through the two ways that we mentioned, obviously electrical impulses, but you can actually receive chemical impulses as well um, that can also be activated through uh, primarily the endocrine system. Now, neurotransmitters are what's going to be responsible for actually moving that message from one axon into the dendrites of another cell or from that axon into the next muscle cell or what have you. Remember, these neurons don't actually directly touch other cells. Instead, they form this structure called the synapse, where chemical signals, which are called neurotransmitters, are released. In other words, These synapses are very specialized junctions between a neuron and another cell. It doesn't just have to be another neuron. Uh, the synapse includes a blue neuron that's going to be releasing neurotransmitters and a synaptic cleft or an area between neuron membranes and the membrane of another cell. In your brain, these are incredibly complex. Sure, you've heard of dopamine before, right? Dopamine is just a neurotransmitter. All it's doing is it's moving a chemical signal from one cell to an uh, another. However, if you have kind of altered uh, kind of synaptic clefts that are able to update that neurotransmitter as well, the system. That's one of the dangers of you know really hardcore drugs like MDMA or aspirin. Takes a lot more for it to trigger that response. Ultimately, you don't want to be just respect or you know quickly responding to everything with you know 100 every single time, and so your body's going to get slowly more and more used to a higher dosage of dopamine, and ultimately it kind of messes with everything. And ultimately, you have the receiving cell, which could be a neuron, but it could also be a muscle cell or a gland cell. That's going to be anything that's going to be absorbing that neurotransmitter. Now these action potentials cause the neurotransmitter release itself. So these neurotransmitters are released into the synaptic cleft as vesicles. So they're basically just little uh, pockets of uh, lipid bilayer that get kind of shot out at the end. Um, sending the neuron, that sending neuron will then have that vesicle fuse with the cell membrane and then release it. And that neurotransmitter moves across the cleft and binds to the receptor proteins on the receiving cell, which opens back up that vesicle and moves it into that next cell. This happens almost instantaneous. Now, some receptor proteins are ion channels. Now, neurotransmitters that bind to ion channel receptor proteins in the receiving cell can cause the channel to open or close, changing the likelihood of an action potential in a receiving cell. In other words, you can kind of alter how well or how quickly it's going to respond based off of how it responds to a particular ion. What happens in these receiving cells? Ultimately, the neurotransmitters might have what we call an excitatory or inhibitory response on those receiving cells. Excitatory, it's excited, it's happy to see it. It's going to increase the chance of action potential or inhibitory, it's pretty straightforward to figure out. It's going to decrease the chance of active action potential. Now, the peripheral nervous system is going to consist of a ridiculous amount of nerves. And these nerves are bundles of axons encased in connective tissue. And in most nerves, that sensory and motor nerve ner uh, fibers are then going to be bundled together in a single cable. In other words, you're combining all these uh, neurons together to form a true tissue cell type, or sorry, a true tissue. And then you're going to wrap, or wrap that around with connective tissue so that way it's not you know, damage from the outside world, because obviously, as you probably heard, um, it's a lot harder to regrow neurons in particular. Um, it's just kind of how your body works. Some organisms are really well adapted to do it. Humans, not so much. So if you sever major neuron connections, you can often not be able to regain that ability again, especially if it's something in your central nervous system. That in particular is very vulnerable. 
So you need that connective tissue to kind of protect it. You're gonna have peripheral motor nerves, which are either autonomic or somatic. These somatic uh, motor neurons carry signals to voluntary muscles. So the ones like your hand muscles or things like that, that you're going to be actively controlling. And then you have your autonomic motor neurons, which are gonna carry signals from involuntary muscles to glands or either involuntary muscles or glands. So your things like your lungs, which can be somewhat controlled, um, are gonna be primarily powered by involuntary uh, motor neurons, or sorry, uh, the, the autonomic motor neurons, which are gonna power those, or those involuntary muscles, as well as things like your heart are gonna be that kind of involuntary muscle that's gonna be powered through that autonomic motor neuron. Keep in mind too that like with everything in biology, um, Definitions are kind of difficult to be like perfectly in a box every single time. So there may be kind of crossover between these two things. But for the purposes of this class, just worry about the definitions that I've given. Then you have the sympathetic nervous system, which is made up of autonomic motor neurons. The sympathetic nervous system is going to be what primarily functions while you're under stress or during emergencies. Ultimately, these neurons are going to cause increased heart rate and breathing rates and slow digestion and route blood to oh, the vital organs. So let's talk about this for a second. So when you're stressed, studying for just from other animals, right? So as a result, we have kind of these leftover things that aren't necessarily the most helpful for, uh, for us, but it's just kind of there. The human stress response, especially to non-dangerous things in our life, say taking a test or, you know, double thinking like how you said something to your best friend, that kind of stuff. It's all triggered the same way that that rabbit, when it sees that lynx, is wanting to get the fuck out of there. It's that same kind of process. And that's why your body does these very specific things. It's going to increase your breathing rate. What that's doing In other words, if you see a predator, you can get the hell out of Dodge, right? And it's slowing digestion and is routing blood to your vital organs. So that way it can keep blood away from your arms and your legs, which you don't necessarily need it as much. And in that way, if you do get attacked, it kind of centralizes everything to your core and it's a little bit better protected. So kind of think it's one of those weird hangups from evolution that kind of have screwed humans, especially in our modern age is, you know, dealing with the world as it is, is, you know, completely different than how we were even 10,000 years ago. You're gonna get to the parasympathetic ner sympathetic nervous system, which is made up of autonomic motor neurons as well. This parasympathetic uh, nervous system is going to be primarily there to return body systems back to normal after you've activated that fight or flight response. It's gonna slow down your heart rate and it's gonna slow down your breathing rate. It's going to bring back your digestion, which was shut down because what's more important, getting away from something or processing food that you don't need for another 10 hours. And finally, you get back to the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. Now there's two types of nervous tissue that make up the central nervous system. You have gray matter, which is where you have neuron cell bodies and dendrites along with their synapses. And this is where information processing occurs. It's gonna be the primary part of how are you able to think? How are you able to kind of control how you exist on this plane? And then you're gonna have the white matter, which is there, has a ton of myelinated axons that are there primarily to transfer Im information from your central nervous system out. So think of it kind of this way. Your white matter is going to be transferring your central nervous system from basically the back of your neck down. It's there just to speed up those reactions the information from the brain and the rest of your body faster. Your gray matter is going to be that thinking part of you, the thing that makes humans pretty distinct. Ultimately, the spinal cord, as we mentioned, is there to transmit information between the body and the brain. The spinal cord is a tube of neural tissue that emerges from the base of the brain and extends all the way down the back of the body. It's something that makes vertebrates unique, right? No other organism and no other animals have that traditional nervous system that we see in vertebrates. Doesn't mean that there aren't other organisms that are smart 
things like Occupy and other have very different order systems. But this is what allowed humans ultimately to. The spinal cord is going to handle reflexes without interacting with the brain. So things like you're just automatic, like somebody touched you and your hand just kind of jump, jumps out like that. That's something, it doesn't even have to go all the way to, up to your brain. It could just immediately process. Things like shivering or hiccups, all that kind of fun stuff, same thing. Um, but ultimately it's there for, you know, getting information from your brain to your body. Um, and it's pretty, pretty awesome if you think about it, how incredibly evolved and interesting this stuff is. Now the brain itself is divided up into three main regions and these can be further divided down past that. First, you have the hind brain, which is located towards the lower back of the skull. Um, the brain does like a very basic thing. Then you have the midbrain, which is the narrow region that connects the hindbrain and the forebrain. And the forebrain is the rest of the brain itself. It's all that work that that's where your emotions, your memories, your thinking processes, that's where all of that's coming from. Now the midbrain and parts of the hindbrain make up what we call the brain stem. So the brain stem regulates essential survival functions such as breathing, heart rate, and it consists of three primary structures. You have the medulla obligata, the pons, and the midbrain. The medulla obligata is going to be there for regulating the actual physiological processes. The pons, which is going to connect the forebrain from, with the medulla and the cerebellum. And then finally, that midbrain, which is going to relay information from the voluntary movements from the forebrain to the spinal cord. You're then going to have the cerebellum, which is the largest part of the hindbrain. Now, thanks to the cerebellum, you can have complex uh, physical skills, such as keeping your balance, trying tying your shoes, or brushing your teeth. All this is going to allow you to be able to move smoothly and rapidly without having to overly think things. You're going to get to the forebrain, which is probably the most important part of the human brain. Now, the forebrain consists of structures that participate in complex function, such as learning, memory, language, motivation, emotion. And there are three major parts of this, which are the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the cere cerebrum. So the hypothalamus is gonna be there to link the nervous system and the endocrine system. So the thalamus is the central relay station. It processes sensory information and it sends it to the appropriate part of the cerebrum. Whereas the hypothalamus is then gonna play a vital role in homeostasis. So it's gonna take everything that comes in through the thalamus and interpret it, and tell your body how to respond. Then you're getting to the cerebrum, which is that mind portion. This is where your personality, your intelligence, your learning ability, your perception, your emotion, all that's where that's coming from. Now your cerebrum consists mostly of that white matter, which are axons that are there to transmit information between the different parts of the brain. However, it's divided into two hemispheres, which gather and process information simultaneously. The cerebral hemispheres have to work together through an interconnected thick band of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. Now the cerebral cortex is the gray matter of that process of that processing center of your cerebrum, and that's gonna be there for processing complex information. The human uh, cerebral cortex is only a few millimeters thick, but it boosts about 10 million neurons that form some 60 trillion synapses. Those numbers are freaking ridiculous. That's more than any, so, so for instance, we have a supercomputer on the other side of campus here that takes up the sides of this room. It still doesn't hold a candle to the amount of connections that exist in your brain. It's incredible. Now, obviously if you were to, you know, combine all the, you know, computers in the world together, you'd be well above it, but still. The fact that like something that big still takes up that much room and it's still nothing compared to what your brain can do, is one of the reasons why AI, while it's progressed a lot, we can't make it think like humans can yet. Hopefully we won't. Um, I'm sure Elon's probably has a contingency plan for that somewhere. Now the cerebral cortex is gonna be divided up into four lobes. And anatomically, these uh, each of these hemispheres is made up of the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. And the function of these cerebral cortexes are going to overlap somewhat. 
but ultimately they're there for sensory, um, motor, and association. So you've got things like senses of vision, hearing, smell, taste, whatever. Um, you've got voluntary movements, which are primarily controlled through the frontal lobe, as well as association. So that's your judgment, your analysis, your learning, your creativity, your, your brain thinking. And ultimately these motor functions are then gonna be controlled by that frontal lobe in the cerebral co cortex. That's what's gonna power all those skeletal muscles as it kind of goes from here to your spinal cord out. And then just kind of like we've already mentioned, you've got the sensory integration, which occurs in the parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. Uh, pretty easy to kind of figure out where most of these are coming from. Things like the occipital is usually tied to vision. Things like ocular, that sort of stuff. Um, but still really fascinating stuff. Now, many brains areas participate in memory. They're not kind of all isolated in one little repository. It's kind of like if you've ever backed up something in your computer, you back it up a couple different places. It also leads to some really odd things that happen. So for instance, there's a person that um, he was impaled by a railroad or a railroad spike um, that literally went through the back of his head. Now, because of the way, the way it hit, it didn't kill him, but it completely changed elements of his personality and his memory to where he no longer was the same person. It completely changed who he was, even though he's still physically the same person. It's just that those parts of the brain were no longer connected in the same ways, and it changed his entire way he lived, you know? Really kind of a weird situation, but there's a lot of very similar kind of circumstances that have happened, especially for those people that have survived massive brain injuries. Now, um, again, we can kind of take clues from the brain damaged patients that suggest that the hippocampus in particular in the temporal lobe is essential for forming long-term memories, but memories are not necessarily actually stored there. So all of these kind of things interact with each other and help move memories in different places, but they may not necessarily be, if you damage one section of the brain, you're, you're, you, you could be SOL, but it just kind of depends. Now, damage to the central nervous system, as we've mentioned, can be absolutely devastating. Sure, you know, we love watching football. We love watching a bunch of other different sports, uh, hockey, soccer, you name it. It probably has some concern with things like concussions, which is occurring when your brain crashes into the interior of your skull and it causes bruising and ultimately damage to your brain cells. And this brain damage can also result from infectious agents Things like diseases or a stroke, which is where you're going to cut off, you know, the blood circulation and part of your brain into where all those cells die. Now, mature neurons typically do not divide. So the neurons that are present in your brain and your spinal cord cannot heal themselves as well as other parts of your body. There may be ways to turn this on eventually, but we're really not sure how to. There's been a lot of people that have kind of been messing around with things like CRISPR and all that kind of fun stuff that can take the same kinds of alleles and genes that are found in stem cells and turn them on in your regular neurons, but we're still not sure if that's going to work or not. And honestly, you don't wanna just try something and potentially kill somebody in the process. Now, ultimately these senses are what connect our nervous system to the outside world. And these senses are integral part of the nervous system. They include general, like general senses, which are all over your body, things like touch, temperature, pain, as well as specialized senses, which are restricted primarily to your head, um, there's a word that you, you may see a lot called cephalization. Cephala means head, so head focused. Um, and that's things like hearing, equilibrium, vision, smell, and taste. Now our senses paint a complex portrait of our surroundings and a sensation and raw input from a peripheral nervous system that can arrive from that central nervous system. And that perception is your brain's interpretation of that sensation. I'm sure you may have noticed, and this is really kind of one of the cool ones, is that certain smells that trigger your very specific memories in your brain, right? That's because there's some sort of weird tie back to where your long-term memory is stored is very close to where perception for smells comes from in your brain. And so for instance, like if you're walking down Main Street at Disney, because it's the greatest, it's the easily the best example. And you catch that smell of like, the waffle cones from the ice cream place. And really Ben and Jerry's does the same thing too, where they've got like the little smellers that put out a particular smell. 
that'll instantly start making you think of that time where you were there with like your your grandmother or your grandfather or whatever family member that you would most associate associate with that place. And they may have bought you an ice cream cone. They build off of that nostalgia. And unfortunately you can kind of trick your brain into taking or hijacking your brain's thought processes, making you think about that nostalgia and make you want to go buy another cone of ice cream, right? It's kind of neat, but a little uh, insidious in the same time. Now, since organs have sensory receptor cells that respond to stimuli, so sensory receptor cells contain a variety of different sensory receptors. Uh, for example, your eye cells are going to express photoreceptor proteins that can respond to light, while your nose cells are going to express olfactory receptors that uh, respond to the proteins that are found through the odorants. And sensory receptor proteins generate action potentials when stimulated. Now, these sensory receptor proteins are able to convert energy from the stimulus into those receptor uh, potentials, and it kind of takes a certain amount to finally hit that. So say for instance, if you damage some of your nerve cells that are present in your nose, it may take you longer to be able to smell something than somebody else. Ultimately, that central nervous system is only gonna detect stimuli that create enough of a receptor potentials to reach that threshold and provoke action potentials. And like I kind of mentioned with drugs in particular, other things can cause sensory adaptation as well, where you've been hit by something so many times you no longer smell it. Unfortunately, I can't smell dead things anymore because I've had to dissect so many dead things as part of a job. It's kind of gross and nasty, and sometimes it gets on you, and you have no idea until you come home and your wife tells you to jump in the shower. Um, but that kind of stuff happens all the time. So there's going to be things like, say, for instance, if you ever worked at, say, a fast food place, you may no longer smell that your body is greasy anymore, like from like dealing with fry oil or whatever. It's just something that kind of goes to the back of your mind, and you no longer think about it. And receptors in the skin can, are what be there to generate those uh, general senses. Now that general sense is gonna be something either detected through touch, temperature, or pain. And each of these senses use its own very specialized type of receptor. For instance, a touch uses what we call mechanoreceptors, which pressure pushes the flexible side of the receptor inward. And as the receptor potential reaches that threshold, an active potential is generated and that's gonna to transmit to the nerve fiber. Now, other receptors in the skin can sense temperature or pain. Now, thermoreceptors are going to detect whether a stimulus is either too hot, too cold, or somewhere in between. And the pain receptors are going to detect mechanical damage to tissue or extreme heat or extreme cold or chemicals released onto damaged skin from those damaged cells. Ultimately, these senses are gonna be perceived into the central nervous system which is gonna be where they're gonna relay those sensations to the central nervous system, which is going to then kind of in integrate that information and tell you how to interpret it, how to respond to it. Now, sensing smell and taste is primarily done through chemicals. So this is through something called chemoreceptors, which are present in the nose and the tongue and respond to um, molecules dissolved in watery solutions such as saliva or the moist lining of the nasal passages. For instance, if you've ever like been in an extremely cold place, or extremely dry place, say Arizona in the middle of the summer, you're not gonna be able to detect smells as well as you could have if you were say down here in Florida where your body's gonna be a little bit more hydrated more than likely. Um, and this is also why in particular, if you've ever, it's something kind of cool to mess with, you can really mess with your sens senses by just like plugging your nose and eating something. It'll com taste completely different than if you had that little bit of a hint of smell as you're eating it yourself. It's cool how that all works. Uh, then you're gonna get to things like olfaction, which is your sense of smell. It begins in the nose. Basically those little odorant molecules that are inhaled in, the, inhaled in the air are gonna be there to perceive certain scents originating from near or distant objects. And a molecule that enters that nose stimulates a receptor neuron, which then transduces this chemical signal into receptor potentials. Olfactory receptor neurons sense odorant molecules of smell. Each olfactory neuron has a different odorant receptor protein, which binds to one or a few odorant molecules. In other words, certain smells you're not going to be able to detect because you don't have the right kind of things there to detect it with. Now, these receptor neurons are going to have synapses with neurons in the olfactory bulb, which are going to be there to send signals to the brain via sensory nerves. And the brain is then going to interpret that information from multiple receptors and identify that odor sensation as a particular smell. And depending on what association you have with something, you may think it's a skunk or you may think it's weed. 
Uh, so the taste is very, very similar. You're gonna begin the taste buds usually on your tongue. Um, that's again there to detect molecules at close range when we put them in our mouths. This tongue surface is covered with all these little bumps called papillae, and that's where your taste buds are actually housed. Now these taste buds send information to your brain with each of your mouth's 10,000 taste buds containing about 50 to 150 chemoreceptors that are gonna generate action potentials when dissolved food molecules bind to those proteins. Some people, for instance, uh, one of the great examples of this is um, cilantro. Some people have an allele that and when you eat cilantro, it tastes like soap, whereas everybody else thinks it's delicious. Um, and as a result, they can't eat that anymore because of the way that their body is receiving that information and interpreting it. Now, many organisms can use something called pheromone. We're not exactly the best at this. So if you ever see like perfumes or anything like that, marketing itself as pheromones, just go ahead and ignore it. But pheromones are chemical substances that elicit specific responses in other membranes or other members of the same species through specialized sensor receptors. Some things like fungi, such as baker's yeast as well, use pheromones for mating, or you can use it to attract particular members of your opposite sex. Spiders do it, scorpions do it, um, a lot of other organisms even inside of vertebrates do it. Humans are just weird because we don't really rely on our sense of smell as much. Most hominids don't, or really most monkeys in general don't. Now vision is gonna depend on light sensitive cells. These are a sense, um, they're basically designed to detect certain wavelengths of light in very specific patterns. And by incorporating all of those rod cells and cone cells together, that's what's going to give you that response. Excuse me. Now, this is the vertebrate eye. Now, light passes through the cornea and, and through this aqueous humor to the pupil. And that opening of the iris is what's going to allow the light into the eye. The retina contains several different types of cells that are then going to detect the light in either rod or cone cells, it just kind of depends. <coughs> now, rod and cone cells connect to those sensory neurons and through that action potential, it's going to send that information from the nerve cell out to other things. Oh, bear with me, sorry. Something like caught in my throat weird. These photoreceptor proteins in the rod and the cone cells are then going to respond to light, create those receptor potentials, which are then going to go out through those action potentials. Again, hearing, very similar, um, but it's a little bit different in that it requires a little bit more mechanical processing. So vibrations in the air are funneled through the auditory canal towards the eardrum. That eardrum is going to vibrate itself, which in turn vibrates three small bones called the malleus egus and sphincter. Also known as the hand rope, hammer and the stirrup. And ultimately, these are going to transmit that information into um, the reception potential in those nerve cells, which is then going to turn it into action potential, which is then going to be translated into the uh, whatever thing your brain thinks it is. Ultimately, it's this your hearing is going to be reliable, reliant on these sensing vibrations, which are unsurprisingly powered by mechanoreceptors. Uh, these vibrations are going to move through waves through the fluid filled chambers of your cochlea in the inner ear. And inside that cochlea, specialized mechanoreceptor proteins are going to be found in hair cells, which are going to be there to detect the vibrations. Ultimately, it's those hair cells that produce those uh, potentials, receptor potentials. All right. All of these sensations are pretty well defined. Stuff of, you know, touches the mechanoreceptor, temperature is a thermoreceptor, smell, taste, and uh, are both chemoreceptors. Just kind of go off of this as kind of your general background for these various different kinds of things. You probably will need to know a lot of these, unfortunately. And ultimately, one really cool thing about your brain is it can interpret all of these sensations at once. And how it's, like I mentioned with your nose and your mouth, it can perceive things differently based off of if it's only getting one thing or if it's getting both of them. It's really cool. All right, exactly finishing on time. This slide is due on Sunday. Finishing the biology one is due on Sunday, September 27th. Exam two is coming too soon. Make sure you start working on the actual extra credit assignment.